Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Susan Guthrie, your host, and today I am joined by another friend who was introduced to me by our other friend, Jill Sharer Murray, a wonderful author of Big Wild Love, and uh, you've all seen Jill's TEDx uh, on the unstoppable power of letting go, but Jill introduced me to Sylvia Foti, who is here with me today, and Sylvia has a story that uh, it, it, that has to be heard. Um, I have to tell you, I just read the book, so let me uh, introduce the book to you all. It's called The Nazi's Granddaughter, How I Discovered My Grandfather Was a War Criminal. Um, and Sylvia's gonna give you a little just, you know, synopsis of what that's about. Um, and you're, I know you're all out there wondering, well, what does this have to do with divorce, Susan? But trust me, there are many correlations between what Sylvia's experience and her family's experience, um, a historical perspective of what happened in her family um, with issues of denial and loss of identity, which I think is going to resonate with all of you. So first, Sylvia, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me here today. We, I put you through a lot to get you on this screen, so I appreciate your taking the time. Hi, Susan. I'm so happy to be here, truly. Well, and as I just mentioned, I I loved the book. For those who are watching the video version, I'm holding up a, a cover, uh, the cover of the book. It's a picture of Sylvia holding a picture of her grandfather. Um, and I read the entire book and was just enthralled. And, and I read a lot of books. I'm a big, I've always my entire life. I was the kid at the dinner table who had the book propped up against the plate and your mom would be like, not at the dinner table. Um, and I found this just, I, I couldn't put it down. It, it, it is such there's so much about this particular book and about your experience and your your way of putting it out there that I thought resonated on both an emotional and historical level, especially with you know what's happening in our world today and what happened in our world in history. So if you could just give us a little bit of a history um, of of your family um, in Lithuania and your grandfather um, for, so that people have an idea of, of, you know, just the legend that was your grandfather. Sure, Susan. Uh, well, I grew up in Chicago in Market Park, uh, super Lithuanian community, went to kindergarten, not even speaking English yet because I was in um, isolated Lithuanian community and grew up always hearing wonderful things about my grandfather, Jonas Nareka, who was a World War II hero because he fought so bravely against the communists. So uh, he died killed by the Russians in a KGB prison, executed uh, by two bullets because he was trying to lead a rebellion against the Russians um, at the tail end of World War II. And, um, you know, he's got streets named after him. He's got a grammar school named after him. He got the high, my mom in 1997, and I was with her, got the highest honor given to somebody posthumously on behalf of her father called the, the Cross of the Vitis. So anyway, um, my mom was gonna write this book on her father. The Lithuanian community there here had asked her to do it. But she got really sick unexpectedly uh, in the year 2000. He was, she was only 60 years old. And um, so she was on her deathbed and had run out of time to work on this big project of her lifetime and passed it on to me and asked me to write the book. At the time, I was a full-time journalist. And um, so anyway, when your mom is asking you something like this, uh, there's only one answer to give. So I said, yes. And, um, you know, I thought I was going to write a wonderful story about my grandfather, World War II hero, was going to be a rather quiet story, maybe just for Lithuanians. And um, very early on into the project, uh, like about 10 months later, after my mom dies, um, I'm in Lithuania and I'm in the school named after my grandfather. And I'm talking to the director and asking him how he decided to name the school after my grandfather. And, um, you know, he tells me 
that before they had this horrible Russian name because the Russians had occupied Lithuania for over like 50 years. And once Lithuania got its independence in 1990, they wanted a good Lithuanian uh, patriotic name. And because my grandfather was born there in that town, they named the school after him. But then he says, but you know, I got a lot of grief over naming the school after your grandfather. And uh, I had not ever heard this at the time I was 38 years old. And I said, grief from who? And he says, the Jews. And I'm like, what could the Jews possibly say about, you know, my wonderful, magnificent, legendary grandfather whom I love so much. And he's looking at me like I'm the idiot, you know, because apparently it's an open secret in Lithuania and everybody knew about it. And it, and it turns out a lot of people in Chicago knew about it except me. And he says, well, he was accused of killing Jews. And uh, I almost fainted when he told me that. I was completely unprepared for it. Uh, it came as a complete and total shock to me. And, um, you know, then I come back to Chicago and I talk to my father and other community members here. And I'm like, have you ever heard this crazy story of Jonas Nareka killing Jews? I'm like, oh, yeah, we heard it. And I'm like, what? You know, everybody knew this except me. And so um, that's how it started. And, uh, you know, we'll get into more of this, but I, I had gone through a long period of denial. And uh, it took me a long time to finally decide uh, to look into all that. So that's kind of the setup for this. Yeah, well, yeah. and I think that I'm that, here. are you getting an echo? I'm not. Oh, how bizarre. I'm getting an echo all of a sudden. So I'm going to pause for a second, just so my editor knows to cut this out. It's actually in that moment, as I was reading that in the book, and I just, for, for my listeners, your grandfather, I mean, there are plaques on walls, buildings that are dedicated to him. You were basically Lithuanian royalty almost in your neighborhood here in Chicago. Your grandfather was larger than life. Um, your mother was a young girl when your grandfather was executed. You obviously never had that opportunity to meet him, but he was truly this legend. And so it's you describing in the book that moment in time when that gentleman leaned over to you and said, you know, he was rumored to have killed Jews. And you just described it as you almost passed out. You know, I hear that from people all the time in the divorce process of, I thought I had the best marriage in the world. I thought we were the perfect family. I thought, you know, this, I thought that, and their, their reality is completely upended and they feel almost that, you know, they've suddenly landed in, in some alternate reality that they can't comprehend. And that's where I saw that, that, you know, juxtaposition or not even juxtaposition. It's really sort of parallel lines here of, you know, in so many ways, we, even once you heard this, there's still that desire to deny you use that word denial. And many people will say to me after time has passed, you know, I knew the marriage was going downhill, but I denied it to myself or to everyone. And it took you a long time to work through that process before you could actually look deeper into this, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, it took me nearly 10 years to, um, you know, that's why the book took me 20 years to write, but 10 years of that was like this really difficult psychological work of, uh, taking off that good halo that my grandfather had and that had really affected my own identity growing up um here in chicago as as a good lithuanian i i somehow really thought lithuanians were only good you know that they had absolutely no dark side to them that they were these idyllic people that they were the victims that uh you know because they were crushed by the nazis and they were crushed by the communists and poor lithuania is just the victim who was standing by wringing its hands as the jews were getting killed left and right and it had nothing to do with it and um, 
you know, what my research ended up uncovering is that it wasn't just my grandfather, like a lot of the country was involved in it because of their anti-Semitism. And that's, so it's a story of just one man, but it's really a story of the entire country. And that's why, um, that's why I was so freaked out about this because it wasn't just me and my grandfather, it was going to be like the whole country of Lithuania involved in this. And who am I to upend the story, you know? Um, so yeah, the denial was very, very strong because I was really, really scared of what was going to happen on the other side if I ever got through the denial and if I ever actually really wanted to put my mind to uh, discovering the truth. So what what helped you or what what pushed you along in that process where facing the truth was the option to choose rather than continued denial? Well, my background was journalism. And, uh, you know, so as the granddaughter was like this little girl, but the journalist, you know, was an adult and more professional. But like in my head, I was always warring between the little girl and the adult. And uh, so the journalist in me really, you know, was a taskmaster and telling the granddaughter, we have to figure this out. We have to find out the truth. Even as bad as it is, the truth is the truth. And you can't whitewash the truth. You know, and the, the granddaughter was like, no, I love my grandfather. You know, I, I can't do this to him. I can't do this to Lithuania. I can't do this to myself. Um, but uh, so my so the journalist in me won. And then and then, you know, I, I'm a practicing Catholic. So that's like this other strong pillar in me. And so through prayer, um, also really leaning on whatever the truth is, as, as horrible as it is, it's better to, you know, face the truth than live a fairy tale. And I'm sure a lot of your uh, listeners going through divorce in the end have come to that conclusion, you know, living through a failed marriage and uh, coming out the other end. So, um, so it was, it was the journalist in me and it was, um, you know, the faith-filled Catholic in me, I think, that finally, again, it took 10 years. This was not an overnight thing. Right. Well, it takes, it takes work anytime we're working through that denial. And, you know, as, as you said, also, it, it wasn't just denial, because even when you start to turn to face the, the reality or the truth of what happened, then there's that loss of identity. And for you, as you just described, um, it wasn't just the loss of the identity of being the granddaughter of a hero, but you were actually upending the identity of your country. Um, and that's what, you know, I think landed you on the front page of the New York Times above the fold, folks, right? Front page, <laughs> New York Times above the fold. That's where, you know, we're earth shattering world making news is. And that's where you found yourself uh, when you did you know, put the book out. So tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I grew up very Lithuanian, considered myself very Lithuanian, very proud of my heritage, and really, you know, in some in some ways felt like a little princess of uh, the community because of my grandfather. And, you know, um, people always tell me, well, it's not your fault of what your grandfather did. This has nothing to do with you. But yet when he was the hero, I was basking in the glory of that. So it does work both ways. You know, when, when your grandfather, you've discovered, you know, played a role in, in the Holocaust and not a minor one either. Um, it affects you too. I mean, intellectually, you tell yourself it has nothing to do with me, but it really does splash all over you and kind of seep in and and, and does um, a head game, you know, to you. And it really started making me feel very guilty, uh, very ashamed. Uh, I, you know, I wanted to just crawl in a hole, uh, get in a fetal position, you know, and make this all go away. But um, the shame of it too, you know, to have to face this up. If your grandfather did this, this is kind of, you, you think this is in your blood, 
Yeah. And, um, and again, it's not just my grandfather. It was, you know, he was not the only one with this uh, issue and this problem. So it wasn't just me upending his story. I was upending the country's story about its role in the Holocaust. So, uh, so that you're right. I, I ended up, you know, um, I started going public with the story um, through through an article in Salon, and somehow that went viral. And then um, within weeks of that release of that story, the New York Times reporter tracked me down and called me, and I'm sitting in my home in Chicago, and he's like, do you realize you're on TV in Russia? You're like, no. What? I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, no. And he said, yeah, I'm watching you, uh, your picture and your photo, you know, you're on TV in Russia. And I had to call you to find out what is going on. And that's how, that's how it all started. And I ended up on uh, the front page above the fold in the New York Times. <laughs> I Well, which, you know, is, had to be an additional, um, experience in all of this a little existential maybe because now truly your family's personal story that now upends a nation's personal story has gone international um when you get to the new york times above that fold and you had to have faced not only we've talked a little bit about your denial and perhaps maybe your family's denial but now you're really like changing um, a, a larger narrative. And I know you faced denial and probably anger um, because you were upending the, you use the term fairy tale. And again, many people see their, their marriages in that fairy tale context. I hear all the time, we were the perfect family. We were the family everyone wanted to be, right? You know, and, and people truly are invested in that. Um, and then the breaking down of the walls and the accepting that that perfection or all of that shininess is not, was not true and may never have been true as it was in, you know, your family's case, that takes a lot of strength, um, to, to get up every day, face it. And in your case, put it down in 20 years into a book. Um, how did you, you know, we talked a little bit about the losing the identity, um, because, you know, I, I guess in, I'm thinking about it as we've talked about in one way you reversed your identity or crushed your identity familially, but you mentioned you're a journalist. And so you cemented your, your perception of self as a journalist. So there were, had to be pros and cons here. Yeah. You know, um, I, I feel like and it wasn't this cut and dry, but when I, when I would, the emotional journey was uh, in some ways just as significant as like the research technical writing journey. And that emotional journey, I feel like is very similar to the five stages of uh, loss, you know, that Kubler-Ross had identified. Yes. And, um, and so, you know, I, I don't know if I did, and they're never in order anyway. But you go, you do start with denial. That almost always is number one, and you do get to acceptance. That almost is number five. But in between, there was, you know, depression. There was bargaining, and you know, the bargaining side was really interesting because the journalist in me was thinking, "I'm going to save my grandfather's reputation. I'm going to prove that this rumor is not true. All right, and then I'm going to exonerate him." So, um, so I was ready to kind of go into that whole Nazi time period, which was just, just three years in Lithuania, um, and kind of look into it. But I was thinking I was going to do it like to exonerate my grandfather. So now I'm already bargaining uh, right. here in a way to kind of get through this work. But it tricked me into um, investigating that time period, which, which funny enough is, is, there's not a lot of research on the Nazi time period in Lithuania. There's a lot of research on the Soviet occupation because that was like a 50 year thing, but there's very, very little on that three year period. Um, and so, so, I, uh, so I, I did get through that with the bargaining. The depression was really, you know, 
within that first 10 years, the denial, the depression, I think kind of went hand in hand. But when I hit anger at Lithuania for covering this up, that's where I started getting a lot of energy. And that's how I was able to kind of um, mobilize uh, the resources that I had within me to do the writing. And that resolve really hit, uh, like I, I really had some good resolve to finish this book no matter what. Um, so the anger in some ways is as horrible of an emotion it is, it did give me that energy I needed until I could finally get to acceptance and now it's a more gentle uh, feeling about it. That's so interesting because I've heard other people describe being able to harness the anger as, as opposed to harnessing the anger as a way to just turn on in, in a divorce case, you know, against your spouse and turn that anger, which can be very unproductive. If you can harness the anger, or harness that high level of emotion and, and put it into some positive forward action, which is exactly what you were doing. You were putting it into the, um, and, and the book goes through it very beautifully of, of all of the research that you did and, and, and all of the people that you talked to and, and all that. So you really harnessed that anger energy, I'll call it, but as a forward mover, not as angry at your grandfather, unproductive, no, you know where to go with that. Um, angry at the people who kept the secrets. Everybody has their reasons for keeping those secrets. So um, I think it's actually a really interesting insight for people to understand is that you were able to take that anger and move it forward. Um, and that's something that I always talk about. One of the things that, you know, I would love for you to explain, and we discussed it just before we started taping, the the title of the book is The Nazi's Granddaughter. Your, your grandfather was not a Nazi per se, but he was a collaborator. And maybe you could describe what you did discover so that people understand um, about that time period um, and the anti-Semitism that you discovered in Lithuania, really. Yeah, he he definitely collaborated with the Nazis. He one of you know during the Nazi occupation, he was district chief of Saule region, which was the second largest region in Lithuania. And uh, yes, the Nazis did come up with you know the order to uh, round up the Jews and execute them. That was their idea, but. He also participated, he never, I could never find any evidence of him shooting Jews personally himself, but he was much more high level than that. He's what's called a desk murderer. So he collaborated with the Nazis by translating their orders and also writing his own orders that were kind of very detailed to the Lithuanians of what they should do, like how they should appropriate their property, the, the property of the Jews how they should collect it, uh, who gets what, um, you know, like if, I mean, this is, this is very cut and dry and horrible, but like he knew his Lithuanian audience. And if there was, you know, a Lithuanian dentist who needed dental equipment from a Jew who was not going to need it anymore, he was the one who was like able to connect all that and put all that together. And so, um, so he really was only a collaborator. My publisher wanted to call, you know, called him the Nazi and I pushed back on that. But authors, you know, when you sign the contract, the publisher gets to choose its own title because they're interested in sales and they thought this would sell more. Funny enough, my title was Storm in the Land of Rain. And now they're going to, my uh, publisher is going to use that for the paperback. Um, so hopefully that will have more success as well uh is and i'm and i'm already hearing orders are even better for that title than for uh the nazi's granddaughter that's kind of a little writer thing and has not much to do with <laughs> your subject but um yeah so he was he was a high level collaborator of the nazis and um some of the pushback that i got you know from a lot of lithuanians well he wasn't really a nazi and i said yeah but he participated in the worst thing about being a nazi you know it's not the uniform that everybody's against uh even though as iconic as it is it's not the swastika or anything like it's the fact that they killed jews 
right. innocent civilians. That was the worst part about being a Nazi. And that's what he did. He was he embraced that part of it. Right. Well, and you actually, I, you just described that so perfectly because, well, he may not, as you said, you didn't find any evidence of him actually shooting or killing any Jews directly. He signed orders that led to um, hundreds, um, thousands of, of Jews being killed. And I, I, that description you just gave about, you know, if he knew a dentist who needed de dental equipment and there was a Jew who was a dentist, he, in fact, your grandfather profited from Jewish. Wasn't there a home that your grandmother and grandfather lived in that had been a Jewish family's home until they were displaced and, and probably killed in a camp or uh, there were mass shootings in uh, Lithuania, right? Where people were shot and, and mass burials. Yeah, in fact, that's uh, Lithuania, like, you know, most people know uh, the concentration camps, that stories, but Lithuania is very different because there were no concentration camps in Lithuania with gas chambers or anything. It was all bullets. It was all death by bullets. And Lithuania had, the, you know, the, that I discovered the highest percentage of Jews killed in all of Europe. And so if you were Jewish in Lithuania during the, you had a 3% chance of survival. 3%. You had a better chance in Germany and Austria of surviving than you did in Lithuania if you were Jewish. That's how bad it was in Lithuania. And your grandfather was a central figure at, at least, especially as a very high ranking Lithuanian in, in right. the process. And so, you know, knowing all of that and, and coming to face that and having grown up as the princess of this, this illustrious family with this war hero, hero, how did you turn it around to, or come to accept that, you know, that, that your his, your history was very different, who you are in many ways is very different and your future is different because of your 20 year journey to write this book. So how did, how did you come to terms with all that yourself? Um, it was slow as well, but the writing helped me really see what was going on with myself and with my grandfather. And um, I really, in the end, embraced the truth as, as horrible as it is. Uh, and so uh, the truth to me is immutable. It's, it's objective. What happened is happened and you cannot change what happened as much as you would like to, as much of a spin you would like to put on it. And so I hung on to that. And, um, you know, once I finally realized that um, my only job is to write the truth, that sort of freed me uh, of all those negative emotions to focus on just telling the truth to the best of my ability. And, you know, my little prayer every day was I'll show up and do the writing and the research and whatever I have to do to get this book out. But God, you're going to have to help with everything else. because This is so big. I have no idea what's going to happen or how it's going to move forward. I'll just show up and write. You get to do everything else. <laughs> Well, and that's, that's worked out because, you know, I, one thing I will say is many people, and again, this will go back to the divorce theme a little bit, but many people, when they find themselves in this situation where history, the history they thought they had about their life does not turn out to be true, very often will adopt that victim role. You know, it's, it's a role that's easy to slip into and I've talked on other episodes about uh, there are some rewards to being a victim. It's not your fault if you're a victim. Um, people give you sympathy if you're a victim. You do not take a victim's role. You do not, you just very, you know, without blame or an adoption of blame, excuse me, you described what your, you know, your grandfather's role. Um, how did you avoid that victimology aspect of all of this? Well, I did, you know, I never really knew him personally. He did die uh, 14 years before I was born. So um, I finally, you know, when I got to acceptance, 
I kind of really just the journalist was taking over at this point and just just kind of disassociating from what my grandfather did. And I was just kind of trying to record what happened. Um, you know, sometimes I did fall into that victim victimology role because, uh, like I said before, you know, I, I basked in the glory of being the granddaughter of the hero. And then, you know, you can slip into just being ashamed of, you know, how, my grandfather, the Holocaust perpetrator. Um, but I guess the other side of it is that I'm exposing him. So that's helping me disassociate from what I'm not condoning what he did. I'm, you know, so that part is very cathartic to me is that I'm exposing what he did. And that feels like a positive uh, action. Well, that's, you use the word cathartic. I think that's an, an excellent term um, because you said it earlier, uh, the, the truth is immutable. We can hide from it. We can deny it. We can pretend it didn't really happen. That doesn't change the fact that it happened. It doesn't change the fact that your marriage wasn't perfect or that you may not have been the perfect spouse at all times either, you know, carrying that forward. Um, and as you just said, there's, there's something cathartic about facing the truth, accepting the truth, um, and, and moving forward with it and it, it, behind you. And I think that's, you know, a, a strong theme throughout the book. Um, uh, and the, one of the ones that appealed to me so much, and you've come out on the other side of this experience, a very, you know, a different person, perhaps to the outside world, I suspect you have grown through this process as well and found some inner strength and um, some positives out of the experience as well. Yeah, definitely. I'm totally not the person I was uh, in the year 2000 when my mom asked me to write this book. It was a long journey. It was a difficult journey. But you know, that's life too. I, I mean, this is just a metaphor for life. Nobody's nobody really leads a charmed life. Everybody always has something to go through. Uh, I think, but I um, I definitely grew a lot, and I feel great about what I went through. Now at this point, I wouldn't change it for the world. I'm glad I I did, and I you know I always I always have this deathbed scenario in my head. If I'm on my deathbed, will I regret? doing this or not regret doing this. And and this is going to be one of those fleeting moments I know in the last moments of my death. I'll be happy I did this. Well, I think that right there says it all. And, and, and it ties into so many people say to me, my divorce was the worst thing I ever went through. And it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And in some ways, there's another parallel for, to what you just said. Um, and uh, what a beautiful sentiment to be able to look back on it in those final moments of our lives and say, I wouldn't change a thing. That was, that was the right thing to do. So I, I highly recommend everybody go out and read this book. Honestly, I, I could not put it down. Sylvia, how can people get the book? What's the best way? Um, Amazon is probably the easiest way you can find it on Barnes and Noble and uh, any other online you can get it through my own website, sylviafody.com. So it is available just about anywhere. Uh, you could go to a library and find it. Uh, if they don't have it, they can order it for you. So uh, and it's, it should be easily found. Yeah, it's it's, and I will have links to the book in um, the show notes. And I do want to reiterate that the paperback is coming out June seventh. I will um, be, I'll post about that when um, it comes out. It'll be a couple of months from now, uh, but this episode will be out before then. And if people want to get in touch with you because you do public speaking, you talk about this and uh, your experience here, and I really feel like it's. Um, it's an experience, as you just said, it's, it's sort of um, emblematic to the human condition. It's very topical for the world we live in today. So how can people reach out to you? Probably my email, lotusinc, L-O-T-U-S-I-N-K at att.net is probably the best. 
If you can't remember that, just go to my website, sylviafodi.com, and you can find it there too. Perfect. And I will uh, put that in the show notes as well. I have an affinity for lotuses myself, as you can see there in my background, right above my uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So I feel I like did it's- notice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, well, Sylvia, honestly, thank you so much for coming on the show and for talking about this, but honestly, for your bravery in, in, you know, writing this book and doing the research. Uh, I think there's something we all can learn from your journey, your family's journey your country's journey. Um, I feel like there are larger lessons in this experience for our world at large right now. Um, So again, I encourage everybody to go read the book, but thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. 